I'm Brandon Staglin, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for watching. Today's topic is depression. It's one of the most common mental health conditions people experience. In fact, over 280 million people worldwide live with depression. It can lead to suffering, debilitation, it's very, very worst instances to suicide, as I've nearly experienced myself with depression from schizophrenia. But there are known and effective treatments and better ones are emerging on the horizon. Our guests today have all been touched by depression in one form or another. In just a few minutes, we'll hear about how their depression has influenced their lives, their work and their advocacy. It's inspiring them in their research. Later in the program, the folks at One Mind Cyber Guide will tell us about their mental health app pick of the week, one called Mood Mission, which may in fact help with depression. But first, his story is an inspirational one. Born and raised in Montana, singer-songwriter Jason DeShaw struggled with and nearly lost his life to depression and addiction and other forms of mental illness. He now travels throughout North America and Europe, performing in concert venues, schools, and psychiatric hospitals, and every step along the way, sharing his inspirational story of recovery. And he's here to share it with us today Jason, welcome to Brainwaves. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Brandon. I'm honored to be here. Well, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. You know, um, we, you and I have both dealt with mental health challenges in our lives, and so have so many people watching today. And we know that mental health challenges, they don't discriminate. They affect all people in one way or another. Uh, can you please tell us a bit about your story? And for example, how did you get from there to here? And how did you first know and understand that you were dealing with a serious psychiatric condition? So I was born and raised in northeastern Montana, a town with one stoplight, six bars, and seven churches. And uh, sometimes, you know, we didn't even stop for that stoplight. But, <laughs> you know, I grew up where there wasn't a lot of people and there was a whole lot of cows and wheat fields and so I learned pretty early on that the little things in life are everything. And uh, I uh, went to college. Well, I grew up working on a farm and ranch along the Canadian line. And uh, then I went out to college <clears throat> and I was pre-med for about a week. And uh, then I uh, fell in love with uh, business, uh, but most specifically the music business and uh upon graduation in 2003 i embarked upon a musical career that took me uh across the pond and over it too and uh met a lot of wonderful people and uh, some famous some not but i started out by playing the college circuit and then i went into the county fair circuit and so I'd, I'd do some in the summer and then some in the fall and, and a little bit in the winter and uh you know it wasn't until i was 29 years old i was on tour in canada in 2010 and a great freight train came rolling through my life my body and my brain began speeding up and they kept speeding up until everything spun out of control and uh, I also, uh, you know, growing up in the country and, and uh, singing country music, I was known to have a beer uh, or a whiskey every now and then. And so that was the tool that I went to, to change how I felt. And what happened is, as the mania began to take off, I tried to slow it down with whiskey, Canadian rye, when I was on tour up in Saskatchewan, but it just exacerbated it, right? So it uh, made it much worse. So the Canadian show promoter called my parents and they said, Jay just isn't himself, you know, you need to come up and uh, get him. And so my parents drove up north to get me. We drove through the night to the nearest psychiatric hospital and when I got there, the intake nurse asked me if I heard voices, and I said, you bet. And she said, well, whose voice do you hear? I said, Johnny Cash. She said, well, what does Johnny Cash say to you? And I said, 
Well, I hear the train a coming, it's rolling round the bend. And straight into the psychiatric unit I went. <clears throat> I, uh, I learned since then, Brandon, that there are places that you joke and places that you don't. But uh, after I survived the initial onset of bipolar one disorder and alcoholism, together as a co-occurring disorder, when I began to treat those effectively, uh, my life began to get better. And what happened is back in 2013 or 14, I met with the NAMI Montana board and I just said, how can I help? You know, I'm a musician. I tell my story through song, but how can I best make a difference in the mental health front? And uh, they helped to guide my way. A guy named Matt Kuntz, the executive director of NAMI Montana. He's kind of like this whole process over the past seven years. He's kind of been my consigliore. You know, I call him and I say, you know, I'm thinking of doing a schools tour. What do you think? And, and he'll guide me as to how, to how to do that. And so... For the past seven, seven and a half years, I've been in the trenches. Uh, so I go into the places where people don't normally go. So the lockdown forensic units, um, VA centers, you know, you name it. What I found, Brandon, is that the darker the place you go, the easier the light shines. So, you know, these people that were sentenced for life to a forensic unit, you could still see that gleam in their eye as you would in, you know, another audience member outside of there. You know, we all carry the spark of the divine. And uh, that's what I try to communicate to, you know, moving towards love and away from fear. We... Well, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted. Hey, but what a beautiful story you just shared and a wonderful insight you shared at the end of it. I believe in that as well. There's a light inside each of us that doesn't go out. It, sometimes we can't see it because we're afraid or, or, or too worried about ourselves to let it shine. But yeah, it's still there and comes out when we get well and are able to, to be in the moment with each other. Um, so thanks for sharing your story. It's yeah. a very inspirational story that you share. And they go, stories like yours go a long way toward reducing stigma, giving people hope and letting them know they're not alone. Um, and in sharing your story, I can see the parallels a little bit between you and Johnny Cash. Like you mentioned a moment ago, um, he would go to prisons and, and perform there for people in, in the darkness. And uh, I, kudos to you for, for doing that for people. Well, one place, I, one place I went that's pretty close to your home is Napa State Hospital. Really? I, I performed behind the walls of Napa State Hospital three times on three occasions. How was that experience? Oh, it was great. You know, they called me. I had I was had some business in San Francisco. I was representing a yodeling cowboy, you know, the old Yahoo guy. And uh he's just a cowboy from Montana and, and a great guy, Wiley Gustafson. He he sent me on a mission to San Francisco, and when I got there, I got a phone call from a, a, a woman that would become a dear friend of our families, uh, a gal named Jan Whitling, and her son was there. And she had seen me speak at a awards ceremony in Washington, D.C. And she reached out to my agent, and she said, do you think he'd play Napa? And as soon as I heard about it, you know, I was, I was there, you know. And she got us through the gate. And uh, what wonderful people they all were. They called me a week before the show or a day, and they said, we have an inpatient band, and they're wondering if they can back you up for the final song. And I said, hell yeah, but it's got to be Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues. <laughs> uh, the whole unit was on their feet, clapping their hands above their head. And, you know, that's that's been the great blessing are moments like that where it's just real. You know, there isn't any politics, there isn't any creed. It's just human beings acknowledging and accepting one another uh, for who we are. And, and, you know, I just look at it that 
we're all God's kids. You know, we're all just trying to find our way home and if we can help one another do that all the better. Jason, wow, you are truly a great man, great advocate. Um, thanks for doing all that you do. And I can see why the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, gave you their Champions Award uh, for exhibiting courage, leadership, and service on behalf of all people living with mental illness. I understand you're doing a NAMI walk this weekend. Is that right? Yeah, I'm the MC. Awesome. Wow. You're going to be a great and, and MC. The, and that. the entertainment in one, I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right, I've been I've been doing I've done Nami walks for uh, many years and have really enjoyed those. Um, but what what made you first want to start sharing your story? Was it um, what inspired you to do it for the first time? Suicide. We were number one in the nation. Uh, we constantly were battling with Alaska and Wyoming for the highest suicide rate in the nation. And when I got into this, we were number one per capita. And uh, I lost a dear friend to the battle, a West Point guy who uh, was a dear friend of mine. I was on his front porch the day before he died. And, uh, you know, I think it's moments like those and losing people that we love that inspires us to, to begin a mission. And uh, so for the past seven years, I've been out there and about trying to bring love a little more light to this world but i'm kind of retiring brandon uh you know i feel like i've done what i can uh, with the time that i was given and what i found was going into so many places and meeting so many people the hardest part was afterwards when you talk with the audience members and, uh, you know, there were some nights where I'd have three dads walk up to me and said they lost a kid to suicide. And uh, that, that wears on you. And uh, I just kind of at the point in my life, I have a little boy and a, and a good dog. And I just bought my son a rabbit. And I didn't have any idea how much bunnies, uh, how busy they are. And, and how much work but i'm so glad that we have george now and I, I decided this summer to turn off the news and to turn on the water and i uh, i gardened this year and going barefoot in the grass and you know it, it turns out that if you water things they actually grow and uh <laughs> so i've been steering my life more into the moment and towards the music i i've put my music career off for the past seven years to do mental health advocacy and it's it's really time uh to return to that well i uh, thank you for doing all you've done for mental health advocacy and i wish you you know great great success in your music career um you've done amazing work so far and you've continued to do so you talk a lot about the wisdom born of the experience of dealing with mental health conditions like severe depression. How did your mental health struggles prepare you for the current moment? Were there coping skills you developed that helped you get through the pandemic, like the gardening you're talking about? Caring for your rabbits? Your son? You no. Know, what, what has brought me the most peace is when I can leave the future to God and or Buddha, or what, or all of the above, you know, basically surrender to the moment. And if I can make sure that I and my loved ones have no needs, then I can finally be at peace in the moment because I have nothing to desire. You know, I don't know if you ever read Paulo Coelho, The Alchemist, but he began uh -huh. and he ended where he began because that treasure, that God-given right is, is within us. You know, we so often we try to reach outside of ourselves for something that is our, you know, is our God-given right that was with us when we were born. I mean, God, I look at my son and watch him grow, and I just think, how could it get better, you know? <laughs> but I think uh, what the pandemic has uh you know, guys like us, Brandon, we've been preparing for a, 
for social uh, isolation for a long time, right? You know, I mean, depression will drive anybody into solitude. And so I believe that the true leaders that are going to emerge throughout and at the end of this pandemic are people who are no strangers to suffering. Because I don't think we acquire the level of wisdom uh, that is required for our world to change. I don't think we get that anywhere else other than struggle. It's almost like coal being churned deep down in the darkness, and all of a sudden you see a diamond, you know, and that's the dungeon of depression. You know, we think that we'll never escape its hell, and then we wake up one day. And life is beautiful again, you know. And so I think, I think uh, we need leadership that, that isn't governed by fear. Uh, for my mental health, I had to turn off the news because there wasn't much I could do for a lot of those people. And, and what I realized is that I have to start at home. I have to be a loving, good human being to all those around me in my community. You know, I started focusing on the inside of my fence rather than trying to save the world in one swoop because like a famous songwriter friend of mine said, some people don't want saving. And that isn't my job anymore. I've, I've shouldered the burden long enough uh, um, and, and I'm looking forward to taking some time to to get back to nature, to get back to, to being me again. Thank you for sharing your experience like that and your, your thoughts about what you want to do. Um, and it's beautiful to hear about the, the knowledge that serenity comes from being who you are and understanding who you are. And your serenity in the storm tours, where you perform songs, where you perform songs, when you do that, do you perform songs that are inspiring you in the moment or is it more choreographed ahead of time? It's kind of both. You know, you go in there with a solid set list that you know will get them. And then you allow yourself to speak from the heart and ask for guidance, you know, because you, you just hope and you pray that you wake up each day and you make a difference in this world, you know, that, that the world's a better place with you in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, these days, Brandon, I sit around listening to Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong pretending it's 1944 and we're almost through the war, you know, but it's people like Winston Churchill, it's people like Abraham Lincoln that suffered greatly that, that, you know, guided us through, that suffered from the same illnesses as we do, you know but yet they still succeeded in leading the way forward. And, uh, you know, in this country right now, it's kind of at an uncivil war. And so it's really going to take leadership, uh, I think, from a lot of us uh, that we're called, wherever we're at, whoever we are, uh, that we are called to the higher ground. You know, that we realize that we are all in this together what an important message to share right now we indeed are even though we may not see it that is the way it really is and today you're going to do a song for us this land is your land what is it about this song that resonates with you oh it's woody guthrie man <laughs> woody guthrie cared about the people that were forgotten by the great depression and the dust bowl and and uh, Woody Guthrie talked about one land, one people, you know. Woody Guthrie expect, respected the fact that we weren't the first ones here, you know, that, that the people that we have oppressed that were here before us, um, you know. You look at mental health, uh, you know, stigma is just a softer word for discrimination. And uh, so... I don't know if civil rights is the right word, but we are part of a movement uh, 
uh, towards compassion, away from fear. Uh, but we have a long ways to go. And until human beings are consistently treated as human beings, we will not heal, you know. And uh, so it's, it really comes back to that necessity of being present in the moment, but also moving out of our heads and into our hearts and living there. Take us there, please, Jake. <laughs> This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream, wow, this land was made for you. I was walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway I saw below me that golden valley Oh, this land was made for you and me sun came shining and I was rolling in the weed fields waving and the dust clouds rolling as the fog was lifting our voice was sounding saying this land was made for you and me I went walking, I saw the sign there, and on the sign it said, no trespassing, but on the other side, well it didn't say nothing, yeah, that side was made for you and me. shadow of the steeple well I saw my people and as they stood there standing I saw my people is this land made for you and me Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway. Nobody living can make me turn back. Oh, this land, oh, this land, oh, this land was made.
Jason, thank you so much. God, I was so moved by the way you performed that, the, the affirmation of the suffering that so many of us experience in our lives, but at the same time, that hope for the future of freedom again, you know, to be free in this land that, that we live in, this land that's underneath our feet right now, present in the moment again. Man, thank, and I was present listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I wish I could shake your hand, but this is Zoom. So hopefully in the future we can get together and I can do that. Nux, as my son would say. <laughs> Nux, there you go. <laughs> Jason, um, please stay on for the rest of this webcast. You're welcome to be part of the conversation. Really appreciate your advocacy and your artistry. So uh, now we have two amazing additional guests, Dr. Kevin Beyer, who's an assistant professor in the physiology and biophysics department at the University of California at Irvine, where he heads up the Bayer Lab. He's also a 2020 One Mind Janssen Rising Star Tr Translational Research Awardee. Also with us is anesthesiologist and neuroscientist, Dr. Boris dov -Heifetz. He heads up the Heifetz Lab at Stanford University. And viewers, thank you for, again for joining us. Feel free to post questions in the comment section of this webcast anytime you feel like it. Boris and Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you on. Kevin, let me start with you. You won your Rising Star Award for your research involving the brain's neural circuitry and how they relate to depression. Can you please tell us a bit, how, is, how are the brain's neural circuits involved in the development of depression? And what has your research taught you about how some people can be vulnerable to depression and how that develops? Mm -hmm. So the foundation of the research that we're doing in my lab is really that we know so very little actually about this area, um, you know, how mental illness arises and, and why it, it can lead to depression in some individuals. And the DSM criteria for depression you know, for diagnosing patients is so incredibly broad. Um, you know, you can have hyperactivity, hypoactivity, you can eat more, you can eat less. It's just such a broad variety, broad, broad, um, amount of, of, of symptoms and presentation that we really have you know, very little clue about what actually is the, the, the brain pathology, if it can be called even one thing. So you know, even the treatments that we have, we really understand very little. A lot of the original SSRIs that are still in common use really just arose from studies in the 1950s where they were treating patients with tuberculosis and they just found that, hey, these people seem like they're doing better after treatment. And so we've kind of developed hypotheses about the roles of monoamines like serotonin and things like that. But if you were to ask anybody on a, on a very fundamental level how those things are working, our, our understanding is extremely cursory. So we're you know, really interested in having a very broad perspective to try to make some traction into understanding how, you know, what, what is it about the brain and in particular individuals that are vulnerable to neuropsychiatric disease and mental illness like depression what is it about them that, that um, facilitates the development of, of mental illness? That what are those vulnerability factors? What cells in the brain, what molecules are, are responsible for sort of pushing people along particular trajectories? That is fascinating. And I can't wait to hear more about how your research develops over the years uh, with this award and other things you're doing in your lab. And you know, I think one thing that may also help with depression is, is simply being together and, and listening to music in a community, things like that. What did you think of Jason's performance? That was awesome. Um, I mean, I, I've just been, you know, sort of thinking about this for a very long time and sort of my own experiences. And it's just, it's incredibly empowering to hear, you know, pe people open up and share their, their experiences and just how many things you can relate to and how many things you've never shared. And once they come, you know, they, they come from somebody else, it's, it's, it just resonates with you in an extremely profound way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was incredibly moved by what he had to say as well. And uh, but I think we've all had experiences like this in who we are as, as a group here right now. Um, Boris, uh, let's move over to you. Um, uh, you study synaptic plasticity and how it can be harnessed to treat neuropsychiatric disease. How did your own lived experience with mental health conditions uh, lead you to start to do this research? So that's, uh, thanks, thanks again for having me. And Jason, I just want to say that was, uh, I want to echo what, what Kevin said. That, that was awesome. It reminds me, my, my uh, baby brother is 10 years younger than me, lives uh, in rural Maine. 
and he's, you know, I went into science and medicine and he, uh, he does a lot of things like farming and but he plays musical instruments and he plays all of them. And it's been a long time. It's been a you know, hard couple of years that I haven't been able to see him. Uh, but I went to visit his classroom where he teaches and he just, just listening to him jam out like live in front of like, you know, making stuff up as he went. Uh, I've forgotten how, how much fun that is. And it's not the same as listening to my Spotify playlist. So I want to thank you for that. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to, to, to Brandon's question. It's really, you know, that's a, um, with, I, there's a lot to say about, uh, you know, neuropsychiatric disease. I think the thing that, really, that I want to focus on is that the capacity for change. That's something that stuck with me for a long time. I mean, I've had a relatively privileged upbringing. Obviously, you know, mental illness touches all of us. And I've been interested for, you know, for, for many, many years through high school, college, my own experiences and others. How is it that, you know, the, the process of social connection and disconnection, how is it that people can enter addiction and yet recover from addiction? How can, you know, people get depressed and they get better? I've watched you know, my family members who have these crises and then suddenly they emerge, uh, you know, and they, they, they do get better. And that all kind of triggered for me this idea of, you know, that there has to be some way that we can understand that process of change and maybe we can be even more intentional about it. Um, and that's what we've, you know, I've spent my entire career basically to, to this point looking at that from different uh, points of view. So looking at you know, how do synapses between neurons do it? Like they can change. I mean, that's something we can study in a dish. One of the studies that, uh, that I, I worked on with Kevin and, you know, where we uh, did a lot of, I think really, really great science together is looking at how, how do you track this across the brain? You can actually track changes across the brain uh, in a really uh, ever more sophisticated ways and leveraging those techniques to be able to understand what happens in a human to me. That's the most uh, you know, powerful translational, uh, you know, project that we can embark on. So that's, and that kind of guides what we're doing right now, where uh, we have a, drugs now and treatments really that are capable of affecting these rapid changes, both in how people connect to each other and people's mood. They're crude tools to say the least, but they're giving us insight into how can we change the, basically the trajectory that someone is on. We're doing a study with patients coming to the operating room. I'm an anesthesiologist. One of the things, we're really good at dealing with hearts and lungs. Make sure your heart's good for surgery and usually that's the end of it. But, you know, if you have a mood disorder, if you're severely depressed, a lot of times, like, we just hope the surgery will fix it. <laughs> you know, but that's actually not, uh, it's a very uh, limited, uh, limited view. A lot of people come in with a lifelong depression that actually can affect, you know, the outcome of surgery. So how, what can we do with those patients to help them change and get on a better path uh, for recovery. Wow, you're doing an awful lot in that realm, helping people from a variety of different ways, the research and the, the care that you provide. Thank you for doing all that. Um, and synaptic plasticity is something that fascinates me as well. I've been the beneficiary of a treatment that harnessed that, uh, cognitive training that I used for schizophrenia, and it was a turning point in my recovery. Um, so uh, I'm a wholehearted evangelist for that as well. Uh, and I look forward to hearing more about what you do in that area. Uh, Kevin, back to you. Um, what inspired you to go into the field of neuroscience, and specifically the study of behavior surrounding conditions such as depression, anxiety, and addiction? Mm. So um, like Jason and Boris, I think inspired by personal experience. Um, you know, mental health has been an issue in my family, pre uh, predominantly on my mom's side, and it hit me pretty hard at the end of high school. At the beginning of college, um, it was sort of just sort of you know, immediate onset that persisted for many years, and you know, really being the, the distance leaving home, even though it was only an hour away from me from home to where I went to school at Madison, um, it, it was extremely isolating for me. And you know, the during some of my most formative years of college, I was suicidalist at the time. And you know, my mom, who you know is and was my my greatest advocate, you know, tried to help me in the ways that she could. Um, in, in terms of support, in terms of uh, bringing me to a counselor. But I mean, ultimately, at the time, I didn't find the, those things to really make a difference. And so it wasn't in you know, my case until I just decided that this was going to be a, a lifelong issue. And, and like Boris said, I mean, there definitely is capacity for change. This, this isn't set. 
um, you know, I can work through this, that, that ultimately there was sort of the self-drive and inspiration that, that you know, got me along and, and got me to where I am today. Um, you know, I, st I still deal with it and I always will, um, but, but just sort of the knowledge of, you know, the, the, the willpower and being able to do something about changing these um, states that aren't, uh, you know, a, essentially a lifelong sentence. So, you know, that's uh, something that um, both Boris and, and Jason have highlighted. So, you know, I, I really kind of, you know, want to, from a scientific perspective, you know, try to you know, make a difference in, in ideally you know, sort of understanding what, what these factors are that predispose individuals to developing depression, um, to, to try to even stem it before it arises. So, so what is it about, you know, social experiences, early life adversity, um, you know, bullying, things like that, that um, can trigger you know, sort of different responses in people, and 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 what is was it a, what is it about people states, either genetic or non-genetic, that provides resiliency in some people and not others, and and hopefully to get to a point where you know, unlike what Boris said, where it's just you, you sort of just you know hope the surgery cures it, um, we start to approach mental health in, in a, with with personalized medicine in the way that we're starting to get to, you know for other diseases that we can start to understand each person's particular experiences and treat them accordingly. Fantastic, that it's so important to help each individual for who they are as a person. Um, kudos for the work that you've done. And uh, Boris, um, you know, you've done extensive work using ketamine as a treatment for depression. How effective do you find it to be generally? And does it work for, for most people? And it, why is it important to discover new therapies beyond those that have worked in the past? So the short, uh, the short version is we do a pretty uh, marginal job of treating depression. <laughs> and the real, the real answer, honestly, to me, it's not really even about finding new drugs. It's about finding ways to improve social, you know, basically the, the, the unraveling of social fabric in our lives and, and finding ways to really engender society and community. And, you know, the drugs may help that process along. This is, we think of this with pain management where, you know, it's not just giving the, the pain medicine, it's giving the pain medicine so you can do the physical therapy, so you can do the psychological counseling, so you can get better. And that's really the integrated whole. Um, you know, we are I, I'm very much in the biomedical tradition of focusing on molecules and drugs. And, you know, that's kind of the system we're, we're, we're in. So a lot of the research I do is really, you know, centered around ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, um, but again, I think keeping the larger perspective is important. These drugs are effective, but we know very little about them. This is like totally, you know, uh, terra incognita. There's a strong signal. Something seems to be happening. It seems to be able to produce these lasting changes. Uh, but again, these are crude therapies. I mean, MDMA ecstasy is, uh, it was a drug. I mean, if you, if you type MDMA into Google, let me know what happens. Uh, you're going to get a lot of stuff about PTSD and a lot of other stuff. So, you know, that, it's again, there, there's promise, but there's, there's, there's room for improvement in a lot of ways that, you know, uh, I think is a, a topic for another time, but the point is that they are effective. And I think the most important way to kind of hone in, and as Kevin was saying, develop personalized medicine is to do research on these, like, you know, figure out what's working, figure out what works about it, and then see if we can do better. We're really good at engineering. Um, and again, let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we're, today we're, viewers again, thank you for watching. Today we're talking about depression, new research and therapies with Dr. Boris Dov Heifetz, who is an anesthesiologist and neuroscientist at Stanford University, and Dr. Kevin Beyer, assistant professor in the physiology and biophysics department at UC Irvine, who's also a 2021 Mind Janssen Rising Star awardee and Jason DeShaw, singer, songwriter, and mental health advocate. We're really lucky to have these guys with us here today. Viewers, don't forget, if you have any questions you'd like to post in the comment section of this website, please do at any time. And if you'd like to share this webcast with anyone you know because you think you could benefit them, please do so. Kevin, back to you. Um, you know, Boris was talking about the development of new therapies, and I know you work on that area as well but it can take many, many years for a, a new discovery to be implemented in a way that patients can actually use it. So what are you hoping to achieve with the funding that you received for the Rising Star Award? And, and what therapies do you think it might lead to for depression ultimately? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so our, our goals are again to, to identify the vulnerability factors and, and, and what it is that predisposes uh, certain individuals to, to develop neuropsychiatric conditions and, and less so for others. So you know, our, our, our goal is to kind of cast a broader net. Um, the, the way people typically do this that are through the genome-wide association studies. Um, where you take you know really broad cohorts of individuals, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and, and you correlate uh, genes or these small um, nucleotide polymorphisms in these individuals um, with uh, particular outcomes like addiction, depression, things like that. And you can identify some, for example, some of the genes that are linked to development of these, of these states. And, and so those are, that's a really good start and, and we've identified some really interesting genes and variants uh, but together, it's something like one percent of the gen of the genetic uh, predisposition, which you know is completely independent or perhaps somewhat overlapping with the non-genetic um, factors that contribute. So, you know, our our goal is to take a very different sort of approach than most people and just ask the question and take the sort of naive understanding and and, and foundation that we actually know very little about. You know how any of this happened, like Boris said. You know, the the treatments we have are very crude, and, and instead of focusing on you know, what we think we know to instead just take a step back and say, well, let's let the biology guide us. Let's, let's try to look into you know, more broadly without really strong predispositions, um, wh what it is about the brain, what, what cells, what molecules. So, so our goal is, is to sort of identify the areas in the brain and, and, you know, when they actually contribute to the development of these states. So when you do these GWAS, these genome-wide association studies, it, it gives you the gene but it doesn't tell you where the gene is acting, in what biological pathway it's acting, or you know, really when it's doing its thing. So what we hope to do by identifying the particular circuits and cells in the brain is to identify the what and the when and the where. And from, from that vantage point, you can then you know, start to potentially hone in on specific therapeutics. So, you know, molecules, genes that are expressed, proteins, druggable targets that would give, you know, the sort of um, potential for personalized medicine that you can identify particular changes that happen in these individuals, including pre sort of predisposed um, individuals, those vulnerability factors, um, and, and allow you to potentially intervene early on. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. And such, such important work that you do to understand how to help people uh, by understanding their genetic makeup and how that turns into actual biology. Um, Boris, back to you. One area of neuroscience research that's been getting an increasing amount of attention and buzz lately is, is psychedelic uh, medications and drugs. And you were touching on that a moment ago, talking about MDMA and so forth and ketamine. What have you been finding with your research there? How promising is psilocybin, for example, and how common might it one day be as a treatment for mental health conditions? So we're we're still we're still learning about, about a lot about these things. Most, um, you know, my work in my lab is split between clinical uh, studies and animal work, um, and you know, one of the things we're trying to understand, for example, is MDMA is known for its ability to foster social connection, and how do we? I mean, how do we look at that as as a mechanism? What can we um, learn from MDMA about you know how you know mice and hopefully people. Uh, you know, generate and develop uh, social connections. These, you know, this is early, early days. We are still just the first studies for drugs like MDMA and psilocybin are just coming out. For psilocybin, there's, there is remarkably little actual data given how much buzz there is in the field. Again, there's tremendous promise, but, you know, I have to be a little bit, you know, less evangelical, I guess, than so of my uh, so some of the folks out there, out there in the media, we, we have to see. We're doing the testing now. We're starting a trial uh, for patients with chronic pain and psilocybin and looking to see whether, you know, changing your mindset, basically, and your relationship to your pain in a very intense therapeutic session can help uh, lead to long-term recovery. But again, I want to just emphasize we don't know the answer. <laughs> that what we need to do is do those kinds of studies first. Will it become part of mental health care? If it works, I hope so. I hope that we can, you know, destigmatize, you know, uh, altered states of consciousness, non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, in in a way that you know that can be harnessed for uh, for mental health uh, therapy. And again, I think this gets back to we building building community and building therapeutic support networks that can 
we, where we can embed these types of therapies. I totally mm -hmm. agree. If it's something that can actually help people be, live their full lives again, if, if, despite whatever stigma there might be around a certain approach. If it works, I think we should investigate it and see how we can use that. Um, so Kevin, Boris, and Jason, a question for all of you. We're welcome to chime in as you like. Uh, a big problem in the mental health field in general is that those who are suffering or at risk for mental illness are often not finding or getting access to the care that they need. And a part of that is stigma. September is National Suicide Prevention Month and Addiction and Alcohol Recovery Month. What can we do to help reduce stigma surrounding mental health? Maybe, um, Jason, you haven't, you haven't spoken for a while. What do you think? Oh, I just was going to say something about what, what uh, Dr. Boris was talking about. Uh, I'm probably the only guy you know that's done 81 treatments of ketamine. And I've done it in three ways, intermuscular, uh, I've done it inter, uh, so the shot, the IV and sublingual, I've done them all. And I've traveled the country looking for, you know, what, it, what I had to find was something to be hopeful for, because I'd spend a year and a half in severe depression and you start losing hope. And when that pain exceeds hope, that's a tough place to be. And, uh, so anyways, I, I did 72 treatments of deep transcranial magnetic stimulation. They pointed the old Israeli magnet at my frontal cortex and 72 times. And, you know, what I've come to believe after being on 26 different pharmaceutical medications, um, I think where this is gonna go is more towards embracing natural remedies such as psilocybin because we don't really have to understand how it works because it's but it's bigger than us right this is nature this is you know our sacred earth this is something that comes from the earth it's not a molecule that we invented thinking we were you know more brilliant than god and so i think what we're gonna see is more uh you know, I could say this, ketamine kept me alive, but psilocybin saved my life. But um, as you say, it's very rudimentary at this point because people don't understand the cold hard fact that taking shrooms and going to a music festival is not treatment for depression. You're setting what you hear, what you see. Whenever I did it, it was with a psychologist and it was wearing eye blinders. So you look within rather than be triggered by external stimuli into some hallucination, right? And then you listen to journey music, Native American flute music, drum music, but it takes us back to the old ways. And what happened to those old ways is they are long forgotten. We still discriminate wholly against a people that had it right. The American Indian knew how to exist at peace on this earth. And I'm from Montana, where Sitting Bull comes from. And uh, those are the people that I think we can learn from. Because I know when I smudge with sage and sweetgrass and Brazilian Hollywood, Peruvian Hollywood, that does something. I don't know how the hell to describe <laughs> it or explain it, but I feel better. There's definitely something to nature. I, I love being out in the outdoors, hiking climbing mountains, going to the beach, um, being in nature is just so invigorating and soothing at the same time. And there was, there were indeed simpler times long ago when we could, when life was easier, I suppose. Um, but, uh, this brings us to the lightning round where we have five questions with quick answers, one question at a time, one person at a time. Uh, why don't we start with Boris then circle around for Kevin's answers and then conclude with yours, Jason. Um, yeah, uh, Boris, how do you feel about that? Are you ready? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Let's hit it. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Turning off all of my digital media and, uh, hanging out with my family. Easy one. <laughs> oh, absolutely. When you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? Uh, deep trance, deep trance, electronic music. Okay. What is a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? Uh, I used to be rock climbing and uh, I was biking. California is pretty good for that. 
Mm -hmm. What is one thing you'd like to see change in the way people think about depression and mental health? Oh, I want them to see that there's a way to recovery and that it's not a, it's not a permanent state of being. Good words to live by. And what gives you hope? Uh, my children, uh, I think more than anything. And again, the, the possibility of change. Fantastic. Thank you, Boris. Kevin, are you ready? Mm -hmm. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Like Jason said, living in the moment, being able to disconnect from social media, you know, electronic reality and, and just live in the moment with my family. Mm -hmm. When you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? A paradoxically sad music. Um, it just helps me be, be honest with myself and how I feel. I find that that's really the only way for me to really connect and work, with, work through my issues. Yeah, yeah, it's right there with you. What's a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? Honestly, I'm still looking for that. Um, I, th I think there's really no substitute for time. And so for me, it's taking time to really just focus on, on what it is that I'm dealing with, being around my family um, and slowing down and, and living in the moment. Love it. What's one thing you like to see change the way people think about uh, depression and mental health? for people to acknowledge um, mental health and mental illness in the way that they do physical injuries that, you know, as Boris said, there's you no know, capacity to come back from anything, um, but we should give ourselves the time and care that, that we give for you know, broken bones for, for mental illness. For sure. And what gives you hope? Uh, that we're in a place like here and now that, you know, the, the four of us are able to discuss, you know, issues of mental health and our own personal experiences in, in an honest and candid way and not worry about repercussions or, or stigma, or as Jason would say, discrimination. And sharing stories like this can be an incredibly powerful way to reduce that stigma and discrimination. Fantastic that you guys are here to do this with me today. Jason, it's your turn. Are you ready? You bet. Okay. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? I think understanding that everything in this world changes eventually and that, uh, you know, that I'm not in charge, that I'm just part of something greater than myself. Mm, fantastic. What help when you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? Yeah, that's a good question. Probably Bob Marley. Yeah. I love Bob Marley. What's a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and de-stress? You know, I haven't really taken a vacation in seven years maybe 15. And so I'm going to vacate for a while and uh, get back to my homeland, Northeastern Montana, visit my folks. Fantastic. On a few birds. Yeah, absolutely. What's one thing you'd like to see change the way people think about depression and mental health? I wish there was more conversations like this. You know, I wish that people could hear uh, our common message. You know, we have so much more in common than we do that sets us apart. Absolutely. And what gives you hope? You know, the word each other comes to mind. Yes. I think, uh, I think realizing that, uh, that we are in this together and that we're all just trying to find our way home. For sure. Uh, one of my one of my other favorite musicians, Peter Meyer, has a song called "All the World Is One," and I really like that song because it just underscores that we are all, all part of one world together. Um, thank you, Jason and Kevin and Boris. Now our team at One Mind Cyber Guy gives us their review of this week's app pick of the week, one called Mood Mission, which it aims to address depression in folks who are struggling with that. Take it away, Cyber Guy team. Hi there. I'm Martha Neary, and I'm the project manager of One Mind Cyber Guide. You probably already use your phone for many things throughout the day, but did you know that there are lots of apps out there to help you manage your mental health and well being? There are thousands of mental health apps available for download today. With so many to choose from, it can be hard to separate the good from the bad. That's where One Mind Cyber Guide can help. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review apps on three different metrics credibility, user experience, and transparency. We've reviewed over 200 products and all of these reviews are available for free on our app guide at onemindcyberguide.org. 
Hi, I'm Stephen Schuler, and I'm the Executive Director of One Mind Cyber Guide. I'm a clinical psychologist and mental health service researcher. And my research focuses on the use of technology to increase access to mental health care. The work we do at One Mind Cyber Guide is important because there's a need for objective third party reviews of mental health apps and rigorous evaluation of their evidence base. Mood Mission aims to help people experiencing symptoms of stress, anxiety, or depression. The app is based in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, which is an evidence-based therapy. Data from the app is being used for a research study conducted by Monash University, so users are asked to complete a number of short surveys before unlocking the app on topics such as well-being and moods and emotions. The app provides different activities or missions based on how you're feeling. You select how you feel at a particular time, for example, low, depressed, anxious, or worried, and how distressing your feelings are. You then choose from a range of options which best describe the problem. Based on your responses, five missions are provided, each with a stated objective and an explanation of why this might help. You can choose to accept a mission and mark the mission as complete when finished. Missions can be behavior-based, for example, learning how to knit, crochet, or sew, physical-based, like push-ups, thought-based, such as self-affirmations, or emotion-based, including things like reflecting on achievements. The mission log shows all completed missions and various achievements, and additional resources are also available. Visit our app guide at onemindcyberguide.org to read our review of Mood Mission. It has received a score of 4.67 out of 5 on credibility, 3.94 out of 5 on user experience, and it also receives a score of acceptable for transparency. We also have a professional review of Mood Mission where you can read some more about the pros and cons of the app as well as some recommendations for use. We look forward to seeing you next week for another app review. CyberGuide team, thank you so much. And thank you to Jason Deshaw, Dr. Kevin Beyer, and Dr. Boris Heifetz for being with us and sharing their wisdom today. And viewers, thank you too. If you'd like to ask questions or catch all of our Brainwaves past episodes, please visit onemind.org slash brainwaves. And don't forget, uh, please tune in next week for our next episode. And remember, what's the brain good for? Making waves, of course. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Thank you. You're feeling anxious, afraid, alone. I haven't been able to see my family or my friends. Families that struggled to find mental health care before find it even harder now. I feel a lot of guilt in not being with my family. Are there solutions? Visit onemind.org, seeking the answers, bringing help to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org. Thank you.